the lowest energy here, eigenstate and, and energy eigenvalue of a many-body fermionic Hamiltonian. And actually, uh, we've uh, subsequently since generalized our algorithm uh, for the calculation also of excited states. So later on, uh, we'll uh, deal with uh, that problem as well. Um, so I'll spend quite a long time on what I call introductory remarks because I have to set the scene uh, as far as um, actually describing the problem and how it's, how it's actually written down, uh, at least in quantum chemistry. So the notion of orbitals, second quantization, and so on. And then I'll describe uh, uh, this algorithm that we've developed, uh, uh, FCI QMC. Oh, that would be great. Thank you. So there's something wrong with the microphone. Let me keep using the signal. I need to change it. Okay, just a moment. So the bulk of the lectures will be concerned with this algorithm, FCI QMC, but which actually comes with a, uh, a slight tweak to it that we call the initiator full CI quantum Monte Carlo method. And the initiator is a systematically improvable approximation to it. So what we will show is that FCI QMC uh, can generate in a Monte Carlo form the exact uh, ground state eigenvector for a fermionic system, but uh, uh, is expensive. And then this tweak, the initiator method, uh, can provide systematically improvable approximations to that. And so as the number of walkers increases, we always can, we, we can demonstrate that we can systematically converge onto the exact solution that FCI QMC provides. And then I'll provide some actual online demonstrations today. So we are we're connected to my PC sitting under my desk in Stuttgart. And then we'll actually run some calculations. It's very important to get uh, you know, real-time uh, real um, experience uh, with this method because it's new. Um, uh, you know, a lot of things that, that I talk about seem as though they, these are going to be incredibly expensive calculations, and in fact, they're very inexpensive. And that's just important to see how it goes, and also to see the nature of the fluctuations, how quickly things converge, et cetera, et cetera. So I will do uh, two sets of online demonstrations, uh, uh, one with the basic algorithm and one with uh, uh, what's called a semi-stochastic adaptation of the algorithm, which greatly reduces the stochastic errors. And then we have a, a, a series of more advanced applications uh, that we'll hopefully come on to probably uh, tomorrow on calculation of properties, density matrices, uh, excited states, uh, self-consistent field uh, optimizations, uh, what the quantum chemists call multi-configurational self-consistent fields and so on. So we'll see. I, I don't know how much exactly of this uh, we will go through. And of course, the other thing is to mention is that if you have any questions, then just ask them uh, 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 as you see fit. OK, so let me just uh, point out that the, that the grand challenge problem that we would like to be able to solve is the many electron Schrodinger equation. Uh, this is here in non-relativistic form. And uh, n uh, being the number of electrons that we want to treat. And uh, this, of course, is the realistic Coulomb interaction, uh, which we uh, generally have to face with in ab initio calculations. Of course, if you're doing lattice models, Hubbard models, or such like, you have analogous interactions. And uh, so this is just indicated here as 1 upon R1 
uh, one upon rij, but uh, you could replace that with anything else you like. And this is the external potential. And again, in ab initio calculations, we would assume that we're working in the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, so you have clamped nuclei instantaneously, so the nuclei, nuclei are assumed to be fixed for the purposes of these calculations, and they generate a Coulomb field, which uh, um, somehow keeps the electrons bounded, and uh, we're then interested in solving the correlation problem that arises uh, therein. Um, and of course, there's a kind of a frustration involved because the nuclei suck the electrons in, and the uh, repulsion, uh, the R1, the, the Coulomb repulsion, tries to keep the electrons apart. Um, the kinetic energy leads you to itineracy, delocalization, and so on. So there's a huge amount of what you might call frustration implied by the Schrodinger equation. That's what makes it so interesting, actually. Um, so, so this is the eigenvalue problem that we would like to address. And in general, at least uh, from the uh, point of view of, let's say, where we want to start, we're going to be interested in the lowest energy um, eigenvalue of the Schrodinger operator. But it's not the absolute lowest energy eigenvalue that we're after. We're actually after the lowest energy eigenvalue corresponding to the eigenstate that is fully anti-symmetric. So uh, it's relatively easy to show that there will always be uh, uh, a, an, an eigenvalue uh, corresponding to a, a symmetric uh, uh, a symmetric um, wave function, which is a lower energy than the fermionic one. That's the bosonic ground state. And in Coulomb systems, the bosonic ground state is way, way, way lower in energy than the fermionic one. So, and that uh, causes what's called the fermion sign problem, that if you uh, generally perform an unconstrained uh, Monte Carlo simulation of the Schrodinger operator, you actually immediately collapse the projector techniques, immediately take you towards this very low-lying uh, bosonic ground state. You can think of the bosonic ground state as where all your particles are sitting nicely in the 1s core orbital, uh, which is usually a mile down. And, uh, and, and it's actually preventing that instability that is, uh, that is the uh, major problem. So the fermionic ground state is usually uh, way above. So the thing to point out is that the, the many-particle wave function that we're dealing with is obviously a very high-dimensional object. So that, if you like, is the primary source of difficulty. And that would be difficult even if you were dealing with a bosonic system, actually. So you have high-dimensional uh, uh, functions to somehow deal with. And uh, for fermions, uh, for electrons, say, the, each of these coordinates refers to three spatial coordinates and one spin coordinate. So our, our electrons are spin half particles, so they will have two, they will have one spin degree of freedom, which has got two values, let's say alpha and beta, that it can, uh, that it can manage. Um, and yes, yeah, so this is obviously a very high dimensional function and uh, that is the primary source of difficulty, how to very accurately estimate uh, uh, the, uh, these, these, these wave functions sitting in very high dimensional spaces. The second difficulty comes from the fact that uh, we have anti-symmetry to deal with, so that if you hear exchange, you see the labels i and j, you end up changing the sign of the wave function. And that is the anti-symmetry, and that holds for every pair uh, of, uh, of exchanges. And then the other thing to point out in this preliminary discussion is that you can see there are no fundamental constants uh, in the Schrodinger equation as we've written there. So h bar has been set to 1, the mass of the particle, the electron mass, has been set to 1, and the, uh, and the uh, electron charge in absolute value has been set to 1. And this actually sets us our um, 
uh, unit of energy, this atomic unit of energy, which is one heart tree, 27 electron volts approximately. It's a huge energy, in other words. Uh, in chemistry, 27 electron volts is, you know, you would dissociate the strongest bonds out there, in other words. Uh, you can think of strong bonds like N2 as being 10 EV. Uh, and of course, uh, it, often in chemistry, we're actually interested in describing very subtle energy changes. And uh, so we're often interested in actually calculating uh, these, these energy eigenvalues, or at least differences between uh, energy eigenvalues, which are out there in the second or even third uh, decimal place. And that's an extraordinarily difficult thing to do, given the complexity of this, uh, of this problem. So one can set up very relatively sophisticated calculations, uh, starting off with Hartree-Fock theory, that will capture even 98, 99% of the energy, and yet is chemically totally useless, by and large. The remaining 1%, you have to still be able to calculate to 80, 90, almost 100% accuracy before you're able to say anything useful about uh, chemistry. So that is the range of difficulty uh, that we're facing. OK. Um, so of course, an enormous amount has been researched about this problem. and. Um, there are different schools of thought uh, which, uh, which are out there. And um, so when we talk about ab initio, what we really mean is starting from, uh, from, let's say, the Schrodinger equation. In other words, starting only from these fundamental constants. And then we want to obtain some estimate of, uh, of uh, our ground state energy. So that is, that is the target. Of course, you have to make approximations. So ab initio does not mean it's, it's missing in approximations, but what it really implies is that we're not going to introduce any semi-empiricism into the, into the problem. Now, uh, if whether this is a feasible task in general, that, I think, is the jury is out there uh, for sufficiently complex systems. It probably isn't. But uh, anyway, that is our... Um, that is our uh, our aim. So one school of thought, which I will call quantum chemical, the physicists would probably call this many-body theory, but essentially they're the same. Uh, and um, that really starts off with making two types of approximations uh, uh, to begin with. So in the first place, we introduce finite basis sets. So in other words, even at the level of solving a single particle, one electron problem, uh, we already approximate that problem. Okay. And so in the simplest case, you could just imagine a basis set that is a discretization in the form of a lattice. Right? And you can make the lattice finer and finer and finer, and that will eventually converge you to the solution of the single electron Schrodinger equation. That's actually not a very efficient lattice uh, basis set. And, um, uh, you know, how to construct accurate solutions whilst minimizing the number of basis functions is a problem that the quantum chemists, among others, atomic physicists, etc., have studied, have long studied, and there are different classes of basis functions that are out there. Uh, we will in the calculations that I'll be showing you later on, be using Gaussian basis sets, which are um, somewhat non-ideal from one respect. You know, Gaussians don't have the correct the cusp behavior at the nuclei. They don't decay correctly uh, into the vacuum. They decay too quickly. Slater functions would be better. But Gaussians have got very nice mathematical properties. And in particular, it means that the relevant integrals that we need uh, to be able to do the many-body calculations, in a Gaussian basis set, they're analytically solvable, whereas in other basis sets, they're not, apart from plane waves. So a uh, Gaussian basis sets will form uh, our, our choice of basis sets. And so when we talk about uh, Gaussian basis sets, we're often uh, dealing with um, uh, functions whose radial behavior decays as a Gaussian, 
And then the angular behavior is given by the usual spherical harmonics. So you can f kind of build complete basis sets out of, those, uh, out of those type of functions. And the point about Gaussians is that they're atom-centered by and large as well. They don't have to be. But generally speaking, you end up placing your Gaussians uh, at the centers of your atoms. So that is the type of very commonly used uh, basis set in quantum chemistry. Um, if you're doing condensed matter physics, in, uh, in, in, for periodic systems, you would typically use plane waves, which is another way of filling your space. That those are usually not tied to uh, the, uh, the atoms. And uh, plane waves are useful in some respects, but unfortunately, it's a rather inefficient basis. It's, it's a nice basis in the sense that you can take it to completeness relatively easily, but it's inefficient because uh, the, the, the size of the basis sets tend to get gigantic. Uh, very quickly. So quantum chemistry in plane waves is something that we've also looked at, but it's not uh, really very practical. But I'm going to assume that the basis set problem is kind of solved. You may or may not agree with that, but that is the point of view uh, that at least I'm going to take. And um, there are problems with basis sets, but that's a separate issue. But the real question, and uh, comes in the second set of approximations, which are the many-body approximations that we have to uh, be able to treat. That is to say, once you've assumed that you're, you're, you, 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 you've got some representation, degrees of freedom, which express how the single particles can move, then you have to deal with the problem that, of the fact that the electrons do not move in an independent fashion. If they're moved in an independent fashion, then already Hartree-Fox theory or mean field theory would give you the exact solution, and you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't have to go any further than that. But in fact, they don't move in an in independent fashion, and that is where the many-body approximation uh, comes in. And <clears throat> so within quantum chemistry or uh, uh, many-body theory, there are then entire hierarchies of theories uh, uh, which try to deal with this, um, uh, with this problem of correlation. Uh, and they almost always start off from mean field theory, which is Hartree-Fock, and then they build up, uh, 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 build up um, solutions based on uh, mean field theory. So, so you've got, for example, many-body perturbation theory, uh, you've got diagrammatic methods of which couple cluster theory is the probably the most systematic way of doing it. And uh, so I won't be talking about these. They're probably going to be dealt with in other lectures, actually. But if you take these uh, methods to essentially infinite order or as far as it can go, and if they don't diverge, then you end up with uh, what's called full CI. And that's just the exact solution of the Schrodinger equation in the basis set that you, uh, that you hypothesized to begin with. So it's not the exact solution of the original Schrodinger equation, of course. Uh, but, of course, as the original basis set itself is then taken to completeness, then the full CI solution does indeed provide variational uh, upper bound, so you gradually get closer and closer to the, uh, to the final exact solution. So that is, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, what, what most people would call uh, the, um, the ultimate limit. Uh, unfortunately, I should say, the rate of convergence to the true exact solution as you um, expand your, your, your single particle basis set turns out to be exceedingly slow. And uh, that's because the, um, um, the as we'll see later on, that the, the nature of the two-particle wave function, um, as two electrons get closer and closer together, and generally speaking, it's two opposite spin electrons, as they get closer and closer and closer together, the wave function develops a cusp. In fact, it becomes exactly a cusp at, uh, at coalescence. And um, those cusps are extremely difficult they're non-analytic objects, essentially. They're extremely difficult to represent in this kind of analytic uh, 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 expansion. 
and uh, that causes uh, all sorts of problems. And again, we'll, we'll touch upon how to improve the, uh, the, the rate of convergence in those, uh, in those cases. Okay, so this is a really beautiful uh, hierarchy. Uh, I don't know how many Nobel Prizes have been awarded by, uh, for this, but it's certainly quite a number. Let's put it this way. But the problems are yet far from resolved. And actually, I would say that the most interesting problems out there all hinge in this, uh, in how to go from Hartree Fock through to full CI. And uh, that's a really good area for research uh, uh, if you're interested. So th the nice thing about this hierarchy is that it's systematically improvable. So in other words, if, if you have an exceedingly accurate experiment that you're trying to uh, somehow hit, which, which really describes very, very subtle features of the problem, then in principle, you can get there by ramping up your basis set, by ramping up the level of the many-body approximation that you're dealing with. And as long as you're dealing with the relativistic, the, so non-relativistic uh, problem, you will always get, uh, get there in the end. And even, actually, I should say, the extension to relativity itself is not, uh, doesn't really cause any serious problems either. So even that limit is, uh, is approachable. So systematically improvable, but the problem is that it's very expensive to do. So in practice, you cannot actually do it. So it's like one of these, you know, it's the promised land that's out there that is just never really achievable. Um, it's expensive. And, uh, and how, to, how to make these expensive calculations practical, that is the interesting thing. And that a lot of it actually boils down to smart approximations, smart algorithms. In other words, given a computer, how should you actually best use that resource that, uh, that you have? That is far from obvious, actually, as a, as a, as a proposition. And um, OK, so that's what's one thing. So density functional theory, I won't be saying much about, but this is obviously Another huge school of thought. Um, it's again probably going to be covered by other lectures in this in this in this workshop. Yeah, sort of. Okay. Well, I won't. I would simply say that 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 although it's formally an exact theory for the ground state at least, uh, it's predicated on the exchange correlation functional. So we have to hypothesize an exchange correlation functional, which somehow captures all the subtle many-body effects that these guys, these theories here, try very hard to, uh, uh, to actually uh, describe. So these exchange correlation functionals, uh, the, the problem with them is that it essentially introduces an uncontrolled approximation into your theory. So if it works for your system of interest, then that's fine. You have a nice scaling theory. It's generally quite cheap. You can scale it up to many particles, et cetera, et cetera. But where it fails, uh, then I'm sorry, you're stuck. And it usually fails, actually, in precisely the systems that, uh, as I happen to know myself, I started off in density functional theory. And uh, so it usually fails most frequently where you have electronic configurations that are not dominated by a single determinant, but are inherently multi-determinantal. And uh, those are uh, like strongly correlated systems. And you get these strongly correlated systems uh, quite uh, ubiquitously, actually. It's not just in very exotic materials, but every time you break a chemical bond, uh, you typically go into a, uh, in, into a state in which the Hartree-Fock determinant is not dominant. There will be at least another one out there. And these methods then uh, tend to struggle. Um, but I should say it's very widely used as a method. And then finally, we have quantum Monte Carlo, which uh, uh, is a relatively niche technique. So out there, you have many thousands of people doing quantum chemistry many tens of thousands of people doing density functional theory, but probably the number of people doing quantum Monte Carlo can be counted you know, in the hundreds, something like that. It's a, much, it's, a, it's a very niche technique, so to speak. It's never really caught on in the same way quantum chemistry and DFT uh, have, 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 have sort of caught on within electronic structure theory. And um, so we'll see. You know, I have my own views as to why that is. But intrinsically, the ideas behind QMC are very, very powerful. And um, 
in a way, uh, the way they've been implemented historically uh, has been to uh, uh, not to use, not to invoke basis sets. So, so usual quantum Monte Carlo calculations work in continuum space, real space. So your particles are not discretized in, in, in any practical sense. They can move around in continuous space. So they have one advantage over these quantum chemical methods, that they don't invoke any basis sets. And so the, the famous uh, uh, cusp problem, which arises when you're using finite basis sets, doesn't arise so much uh, in, in these uh, continuum space methods. But um, unfortunately, because we have uh, the, uh, the problem that we're dealing with fermionic wave functions, so that our functions are necessarily negative in some places and positive in others, um, you have to impose some constraints in the sampling. And that introduces a, a fixed node approximation. And it turns out that these constraints uh, introduce another uncontrolled source of error. They're extremely difficult to remove the constraints or to push them, if you like, towards the exact, uh, 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 the exact constraints where the nodes of the ground state wave function are. And um, you know, no one has any practical means of doing that. And so this is another source of uncontrolled error in conventional QMC, um, which actually I don't think is that different when you look at it in practice from DFT calculations. So people have done very extensive benchmarks uh, of these. And despite the fact that these calculations tend to be a hell of a lot more expensive than DFT, you don't actually see the benefit at the end of the day in terms of dramatically reduced errors, for example. That's the sort of thing. If you're spending a 1,000 times more compute power, then you would certainly expect to see some, um, you know, some benefit uh, in that regard. But by and large, that's not true. So, but now, um, w one of the interesting things is that, so I've actually highlighted these three as three different, um, uh, like, uh, subjects almost. Um, but actually, the interfaces between these are very, very interesting. And a lot of the, a lot of the research that currently goes on is looking at the interface between quantum chemistry and many-body theory and density functional theory. So if you like, how to improve these exchange correlation functionals by borrowing ideas from many-body theory. That's a big area of, of research. And um, that's fine. But another uh, 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 interface that's very interesting, essentially rather unexplored, is the interface between quantum Monte Carlo and uh, quantum chemistry. So, in other words, using stochastic ideas to actually solve uh, these types of problems. And uh, from an algorithmic perspective, this turns out to be really interesting, actually. Plenty of, uh, plenty of space, if you like, virgin territory out there uh, to investigate. And so what we're going to be doing is actually looking at uh, QMC in the context of solving the full CI problem, which is probably the most interesting one, actually. But one can also think of there's also quite nice work from uh, actually originating from, uh, from my own students who've gone off and done their own thing, so to speak, but how to solve a couple cluster equations using uh, QMC as well. And that's another very interesting. It becomes technically much harder, but uh, potentially, very, uh, potentially very rewarding. OK, so let's now. Um, uh, get to some more detail. So the first thing uh, to introduce is the notion of slated determinant space, um, which is the appropriate Hilbert space if you're dealing with fermions. So fermions have this uh, anti-symmetry property that is absolutely fundamental. So there's, you know, if you're doing calculations on fermions, the one thing that you cannot allow to be violated at all costs is their anti-symmetry. That's the... Uh, uh, that's, uh, that's the name of the game. And, um, and in a way, uh, the way the quantum chemists have, have dealt with this 
uh, is to uh, introduce functions which are manifestly, every single one of them, anti-symmetric. And then you're going to use that as a basis to expand uh, the, uh, the wave functions that you're going to be interested in. So this is entirely analogous, by the way, to setting up uh, second quantized uh, algebras where you've got uh, creation and annihilation operators which obey the fermionic, uh, uh, fermionic commutation uh, or anti-commutation relations. They're entirely uh, uh, analogous things. So what we suppose uh, is that we have in our hand a set of uh, spin orbitals uh, or uh, 2m spin orbitals or m spatial orbitals. Okay. Um, so you can think of it if you're a, if you're a, if you if you're used to dealing with lattices, lattice models. You can think of a spatial orbital simply as one lattice site. If you're dealing with a Hubbard model, each lattice site would correspond to an orbital. You can think of it if you're a quantum chemist that would correspond to, let's say, having an S function on each lattice site. But of course, this is a much more general notion. You can deal with symmetry adapted functions which obey. Uh, uh, symmetry uh, properties of the underlying Hamiltonian or whatever. So we're just going to keep it abstract for the moment. And so we're going to say we have 2m functions, u1, u2, up to u2m, which somehow somebody has given us. Now, uh, that can either be the specification of the problem, as it would be in the case of the Hubbard model, or it could be a quantum chemistry calculation where somebody has done a Hartree-Fock calculation, and those Hartree-Fock orbitals are then our set of, uh, our set of uh, uh, spatial orbitals. And for each orbital, we then associate either an alpha spin or a beta spin, and that then becomes our spin orbital. So that is how we generate 2m functions. And uh, so when you're doing your Hartree-Fock calculations, you have to specify your basis set to begin with. That specifies the number of spatial orbitals. And, uh, and of course, if you do a more refined Hartree-Fock calculations, then the number of spatial orbitals increases, and uh, you, you get a better resolution of your single particle, uh, single particle um, description. OK, now we want to do. Uh, a, a calculation with n electrons. Okay, so we have m spatial orbitals. So m can be let, let's say a hundred, um, and uh, when, and now we want to uh, do a calculation with n electrons. Let's say we're doing it with the nitrogen molecule. We'll do, we'll deal with that later on. So nitrogen has actually got fourteen electrons, and um, it's got 14 electrons, but four of the electrons are core electrons. So they sit uh, either in the 1s orbital of this nitrogen atom or the 1s orbital of that nitrogen atom. They're a long way down in energy, and uh, we can assume that they're frozen. Of course, they're actually not frozen, and in practice, you could correlate those uh, if you like. But let's, for the moment, deal only with the valence electrons of uh, of nitrogen, and that would mean that we have a 10 electron problem. And furthermore, we're going to say, well, actually, it's a spin unpolarized system, the nitrogen that's sort of uh, spinning around us right now. So each one is spin unpolarized. So we're going to say that of those 10 electrons, five of them are spin up and five of them are spin down. And so that is the, uh, that is the uh, problem that we face. Now we're going to ask, well, how many of these slated determinants could we actually construct given our m spatial orbitals? Okay, so we have m spatial orbitals, two m spin orbital, uh, uh, two m uh, spin orbitals, and what I show here is a representation. Each one of these lines is a representation of our spatial orbitals, and each one of our spatial orbitals, if you like, can take can accept either an alpha electron or a beta electron. Um, so here goes, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Um, if you're doing Hartree-Fock theory, this is how you would actually fill up your, uh, your, uh, your uh, orbitals. 
to, uh, to construct uh, the, the lowest energy eigenstate. So, uh, again, I'm assuming that these lines, as I've drawn them, these are the Fock energies. They've actually been given to us by our Hartree-Fock uh, by a Hartree Fock calculation. And that's, by the way, no real uh, bottleneck at all. Okay, so that's a specific representation. And this thing here represents one uh, Slater determinant. So, uh, so essentially, uh, you would be uh, uh, creating products of these, uh, of these orbitals and then anti symmetrizing them. That uh, pr produces you a given slated determinant. And this normalization, 1 over the square root of n factorial, is the normalization that you need uh, for, these, uh, for these determinants. And now, you see, you can start exciting electrons out of, out of uh, the Hartree-Fock determinant. So, for example, you can create a double excitation where you uh, excite these two spin-down uh, electrons, leaving two holes in the original Hartree-Fock determinant and creating two particles in the, in, the virtual, in the virtual manifold. So we'll often talk about the occupied orbitals, meaning occupied in Hartree-Fock. These are the occupied orbitals. And these orbitals, which have a higher energy, are the virtual orbitals. And the correlation problem that we're going to face is how to excite electrons from a Hartree-Fock determinant out uh, into this virtual space, which create higher energy determinants, and how these higher energy determinants remix with the original Hartree-Fock determinant to produce you a lower energy overall solution. So this is a uh, so this one you see is a is is a is a slated determinant with two holes in the in the original Hartree-Fock and two particles, and this one is four holes and four particles and so on. And so you can imagine you have a kind of a, I think of it as like an onion shell. Uh, at the center of your Hilbert space is your Hartree-Fock determinant. And then you have a set of determinants which are single excitations, so you've just excited one electron. And then you have a set of determinants which are double excitations, D, I, J, A, B. So this notation means you've emptied orbitals I, J, and you've filled orbitals A, B. And then you have a set of determinants that are triple excitations all the way out to n-fold excitations, where you've taken every single one of these, uh, uh, these uh, electrons and you've uh, put them into the, into the virtual space. And uh, at least the first approximation in simple problems, this hierarchy that I've pointed out is a reasonable hierarchy describing the importance, uh, the importance of the determinants. But I should say that that's a very, very crude first-order approximation to it. So there will be determinants which are, let's say, sitting out here, in, 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 which are quadruple excitations of the original Hartree-Fock that are actually much more important than a whole set of determinants which are sitting closer, closer uh, in, in energy on the double excitations. And one of the problems that we face is that we don't actually know at the end of the day which are going to be the important determinants from the point of view of correlation, or which are the unimportant determinants uh, from the point of view of correlation. The only thing that we know is that we have a hell of a lot of determinants to deal with. And how many of them do we have? Well, uh, from a strictly mathematical point of view, we have n alpha, let's say, spin-up electrons, and there are m orbitals that we can distribute our n alpha electrons in them. And so the number of ways that we can do that is this binomial coefficient, m choose n alpha. And the same we can do for our beta electrons, m choose m beta. So the total Hilbert space that we're dealing with is uh, this product. And um, uh, so this grows... Uh, extraordinarily quickly, gets out of hand extremely quickly. Uh, so for this problem, uh, here with 100 spatial orbitals and 10 electrons spin unpolarized, you end up with 10 to the 16. Uh, so if you wanted to store the uh, a one vector, if you like, uh, of this problem, you would require a vector with 10 to the 16 words associated with that's about 80,000 terabytes. And so that's before you've even done anything uh, actually uh, uh, manip to manipulate the problem. And so that, if you like, is the, is the nub of the many, many, many part, many body problem. The 
underlying Hilbert space just gets out of hand extremely quickly. And it's how we deal with that problem, ultimately, that is, uh, that is uh, what we try to face. So in full CI, uh, we don't try to uh, confront that problem, but we just state it. So we're looking for psi zero, which is the variationally the very best lowest energy um, uh, wave function, which is simply going to be a linear superposition over all of these, uh, let's say, 10 to the 16 uh, objects. So in full CI, the dynamical variables of our theory are these CI coefficients. So these are the objects that we will try to vary, if we can, in such a way as to get the lowest energy solution to this problem. And because these DIs are already anti-symmetric, it will give us the lowest energy anti-symmetric solution. And, and that, is, uh, that is a statement of the problem. So in a way, it's easily stated. It's a ground state eigenvalue problem in an exponentially large space. That is, in essence, the problem that we face. Now, um, these objects here, this is the matrix element of the Hamiltonian between a pair of stator determinants. Now, I'll mention a little bit about that to somebody who's just coming into this might say, well, crikey, that's going to be a very difficult problem uh, to, uh, to actually evaluate. Fortunately, those matrix elements come from a computational perspective, turn out to be very easy objects to evaluate. In fact, you can calculate them in order one operation. So that's a good thing. But uh, the point is that there's no rhyme or reason to these matrix elements. They can be positive, they can be negative, they can be large, they can be small, they can be all over the place. And the very fact that they can be uh, positive or negative, in turn implies that these CI coefficients can themselves be positive or negative. In fact, you can show that, for example, if all these Hamiltonian matrix, if all the off-diagonal matrix elements were all negative, then the corresponding CI vector would be entirely positive. And actually, there'd be no sign problem in that, in that and you could do straightforward Monte Carlo uh, calculations on that. But unfortunately, that's not the case. We have to treat the general problem in which these uh, can be positive or negative. And actually, somebody might ask, well, what about complex, uh, complex Hamiltonian matrix? And the answer is yes, they can even be complex. And that's also a problem that we have to uh, be able to deal with as well. Um, but I should point out that the sign problem that we face here is not the fermion sign problem. So we're not having to deal with the fact that we've got a system that's unstable with respect to a bosonic solution, which, as I say, the bosonic uh, uh, ground state is much, much lower in energy. So it's a sign problem, but it's a weaker sign problem in general. Um, how large can we actually go if you're trying to do this? The answer is about 10 to the 10 determinants. You can probably do about 10 to the 11 determinants nowadays if you really push the boat out. Um, so that means this problem, 10 to the 16, is completely out of, out of range uh, for the foreseeable future. And this is also a very modest problem, by the way. Of course, we want to deal with more than 10 electrons, etc., etc. Okay. Um, now, let me just point out some properties of full CI wave functions, um, some of which are obvious and some, some of which are less obvious. The first one is that this is variationally the minimum energy achievable within the given one particle uh, basis. So it's, it produces a, a useful, actually, upper bound on the exact solution, number one. Number two, less obviously, is that this total energy is invariant orthonormal transformations of the orbitals. So that means that if we just go back to this statement, so I emphasized that we were dealing with Hartree-Fock orbitals, which is a specific linear combination of our, uh, of our single particle basis sets. But actually, the full CI energy is invariant to that. So I could have chosen a different basis set, a different linear combination, and that wouldn't change my energy. It would change my solution, of course. So the CI vector would change as I change my single particle representation. But the energy doesn't change. And a very interesting question is, from the point of view of full CI, what is the best single particle representation? 
In other words, which choice of orbitals produces the most compact form of wave function? And um, I don't think the answer to that is actually known. There are many conjectures onto it, and we can test with these various conjectures. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But um, anyway, that's a very interesting question. Maybe I'll come onto that later on. Um, so that's one thing. Now, the other thing is that our wave functions are pure spin eigenfunctions. In other words, if you apply the S squared operator to it, you'll always get a function of the type S, S plus 1 times the original function. I should point out this is true in the case of non-degenerate uh, wave functions. If you have a degenerate wave function, then you don't have to be a pure spin eigenfunction, even if you're the exact solution. But if you're non-degenerate, then the corresponding solutions are pure spin eigenfunctions. So in principle, if I give you an, a full CI wave function, non-degenerate, it has a well-defined spin uh, uh, associated with it. And you could discover what that spin is through this uh, by applying this S squared operator. Um, another very important property is that our uh, energies are size consistent which is a, a, a kind of a special case of size extensivity. So what that means is that if I've got uh, a system which actually consists of two widely separated fragments, okay, so A and B, but these are actually widely separated, and I do a full CI calculation on that system, I get some energy, and then I go away and I do... Uh, full CI calculation on each individual fragment in the absence of the other one. And I get uh, the corresponding energies of the fragments EA and EB. Then if I add EA and EB together, I get what the original full CI uh, told me I should get. And that's actually an extremely important property, obviously, in chemistry. If you're trying to dissociate a bond, you absolutely need the size consistency uh, uh, condition fulfilled, um, but it's a very, very tough constraint on the approximations. So it's very easy to construct size inconsistent theories, actually. And one type of size inconsistent theory uh, is that if you take your original Hilbert space and truncate it at some excitation level. So if you take your original Hilbert space and take only, let's say, the set of determinants up to double excitations of the Hartree-Fock, and you calculate the energies in that restricted, truncated Hilbert space, you find your energies are not size consistent. Okay, so if you do this calculation, let's say, for a nitrogen molecule, you will not find that the energy of two, nit two, let's say, frat two nitrogen atoms at a long separation will not equal the corresponding energy of... Uh, one nitrogen molecule, one nitrogen atom multiplied by two. So this size consistency uh, is obviously an obvious property that should be uh, uh, um, should always be satisfied. But there are many approximations which violate it, and they're usually not useful approximations. Um, so that's good. So we're, so so these are four uh, desirable properties. But uh, the undesirable property which of our full CI wave functions, but this is actually more general of any kind of orbital expansion of this type, is, that the, fa is the fact that the wave functions do not satisfy the electron-electron cusp condition. So the, so the wave functions do not linearly, uh, so as two electrons coalesce, the wave functions do not linearly uh, uh, decrease in magnitude, in amplitude as that occurs. They always, they always have a uh, rounded... Um, so, so there's two electrons. Uh, so, so if you imagine you fix one electron and now you scan, uh, you, you ask for the amplitude of the wave function as you're moving the second electron through it, uh, the wave function, so this is... Uh, psi of R12, the wave function itself uh, for alpha-beta correlation um, 
goes through a cusp so that when the two electrons are actually on top of each other, you have a non-analytic uh, non behavior at that point. And that's actually how the energy doesn't diverge. So I should point out this value here is non-zero. So there is a non-zero amplitude for two electrons to be, for two opposite spin electrons to be actually exactly on top of each other. So how, do, how is it that the energy of that isn't infinite? The answer is, well, the Coulomb energy is infinite, but the kinetic energy is minus infinite. And, and the way this, this has been set up is that those two infinities exactly cancel each other, and uh, you end up with a finite number. So the point is that whenever you're dealing with finite basis sets, you don't get this behavior. You cannot resolve that. that. And in fact, the wave functions typically, uh, typically display this kind of behavior. So they round it off. And as you increase your basis set, you describe this correlation hole better and better. But it's a very, very slow uh, convergence. So that is the, uh, that is the problem. Uh, slow convergence with respect to basis set. And this means one needs to use large basis sets and extrapolate to the complete basis set limit. OK. Um, now, what about these Hamiltonian matrix elements? So, so the first thing to point out is that because our um, Hamiltonian contains at most two-body interactions, at least for electronic problems, um, you can easily show that if you've got two slater determinants that differ by more than two spin orbitals, then the orthogonality properties of the uh, single particle orbitals means that those Hamiltonian matrix elements are all zero which is great. So there's some, some sense of locality uh, in, in, our, uh, in our Hamiltonian in this Hilbert space. So here is, a, is, is a one slated determinant. Uh, in red is, for example, the occupied orbitals. Uh, and here's another one. So you can see I've basically emptied orbitals ij, and I've uh, filled orbitals ab, spin orbitals. And so these two, I say that these two slater determinants differ in two spin orbitals. Okay? Semantically, you might say they differ in four spin orbitals, but that's what I mean when I say they differ in two spin orbitals. Now, what you can show is that the corresponding Hamiltonian matrix element only contains the Coulomb operator, because only the Coulomb operator is two-body. The other stuff is one-body, so you don't have to deal with it. And the corresponding matrix element turns out to be the difference between two numbers, uh, which is the um, four index integrals ij multiplied by uh, the Coulomb kernel R12 multiplied by the corresponding uh, orbitals ab. Uh, so it's ij ab minus ij ba. Now these, these are integrals which the quantum chemistry code, the Hartree-Fock solver or whatever, has already generated for you as a byproduct of those calculations. So whenever you do your Hartree-Fock calculation, unbeknown to you, actually the code has generated a long list of these, of these integrals. Actually, you can see that there will be m to the four of them in general. Now, I may not print them out. In which case, you have to you know, <laughs> get them to print it out. And so that's most of our work in interfacing with various quantum chemistry codes has been exactly that. Um, but once you read these integrals in, and you can more or less store them in memory, m to the 4, and then there are various symmetries which you can use to reduce that m to the 4 by a factor of 8, roughly. Once you've read those in, uh, uh, you can then, on the fly, calculate the Hamiltonian matrix elements. Um, essentially, by looking up, for, given, for, for a given uh, pair of uh, slated determinants, it's relatively easy to perform a line-up operation. So you line up the orbitals that match, the holes that match, and the orbitals and holes that don't match then give you the IJAB indices. <laughs> 
and then you can just look up the relevant uh, four index integrals and calculate the matrix elements. So this is a bit of technology, uh, but, the mo but the main point is that these Hamiltonian matrix elements are basically order one operations. They're extremely fast. So just to give you an idea, you, you know, in our code, we can generate these on the fly on the order of something like 10 to the 7 per second per core. So these moves, the Monte Carlo moves that we'll be doing later on, which fundamentally involve this kind of electron hole pair excitation, are exceedingly efficient to, to actually implement on a, on a, on a computer. Um, where, the matrix, where the slated determinants differ only by one spin orbital, the corresponding matrix elements is a bit more complicated. So essentially here you take, uh, so if they differ by one spin orbital, let's say I going to A, then you have to trace out the orbitals, the remaining n minus 1 orbitals where they actually match. So you have an order n operation here. And where they're actually the same operator, same determinant on both sides, then you have a double loop of order n squared uh, in the calculation of the Hamiltonian matrix elements. So, so the most, most expensive matrix elements are the diagonal matrix elements, the energy of a given determinant. And uh, so those are actually ones that we can afford to store, uh, as I'll mention later on. So that's how we try to minimize the impact of the more expensive uh, matrix elements later on. Okay, now, one of the interesting things about our slated determinant space uh, is that it turns out to be a giant network. It's giant because it's got, let's say, 10 to the 16 nodes on it, if you're dealing with the problem that we were dealing with earlier on. It's a giant network, but it's a network which is, on the one hand, local in connectivity, um, but, on the other hand, it has small world character. And what that means is the following, is that obviously the number of nodes around uh, grows exponentially in N and M. That's a feature of this binomial, uh, of this byproduct of binomial coefficient. It's growing, fundamentally it's growing exponentially in the number of orbitals and electrons. Uh, and the connectivity around each node of our network, each slater determinant, is roughly uniform. Because essentially, given any determinant, there are roughly n squared, m squared double excitations away from it. You can pick two electrons to excite from and two holes to excite to. And that scales as n squared, m squared. So roughly speaking, to first order, we have a uniform graph, so to speak, a uniform connectivity. The details, of course, in practice enter because there are symmetry restrictions which restrict uh, the, uh, so which, which means some matrix elements are zero, et cetera. So this is a, an upper bound to the connectivity of it. But n squared m squared is still actually quite a large uh, number. So out of each slated determinant, you have a large number of connections uh, coming out. So you can just plug in if n is 10 and m is 100, you can see what n squared m squared is getting to, probably about a million, something like that. So you have a very high dimensional network, in other words. In fact, it's essentially close to infinite dimensional for uh, most pract practical purposes. Now, these infinite dimensional networks are actually very interesting because it means that uh, you can set up, if you like, particle flows relatively easily in, on them. So if you have networks with very restricted uh, dimensionality, uh, then you know, things don't necessarily flow through this network very, very easily. But where the connectivity is very high, you actually end up with very few bottlenecks. And so, uh, and that's a, that's a great thing, because as we'll be doing later on, where we're going to be setting up walkers on this network, these walkers will be able to move around our network with great efficiency, relatively few bottlenecks. That's not to say that you can actually set up some pathological systems with bottlenecks in them. And then that's a type of system where the... Uh, where well, the algorithm won't work so well. It gets trapped. But otherwise, um, 
it's, uh, there are very few ergodic bottlenecks. And, of course, the other thing to point out is that it does, you need only at most n over 2 steps to go from any one slater determinant to any other slater determinant uh, in this network. So it's a relatively well-connected network as a result. So n over 2 is basically is the number of double excitations which you need to connect any pair of slater determinants, n being the number of electrons. So in, in this network where we had 10 to the 16, uh, 10 to the 16 uh, slater determinants, uh, n is 10, n over 2 would be 5. So in only 5 moves, you can go from one point in your Hilbert space to any other point with 10 to the 16 elements in it. So that's, uh, that's also a good thing. And then finally, I should point out that the FCI problem is a linear problem with only one minimum in the problem. So uh, the other, the other uh, stationary points are all uh, saddle points. And that, again, from an optimization perspective, is, is, is nice. Uh, the other many-body methods, such as couple cluster theory, end up with non-linear uh, problems to solve. And so you end up with uh, uh, non-linear problems. And uh, they're obviously always going to be harder. OK, so the idea is, um, is to combine QMC with quantum chemistry and actually this, this combination, so we're going to solve uh, the, our full CI problem by, co by concepts that come from QMC. And actually, this mixture takes the form of a very, very simple algorithm that I call the game of life. It's a bit like the game of life, actually. So uh, you have walkers that, that give birth, that die, that annihilate each other. And, and if you play this uh, with a simple set of rules, but definite, and you run it for long enough, you actually converge onto the full CI solution. And um, what's nice is that these solutions are truly emergent solutions. So you, end, you don't start off by knowing anything about the ground state, and you actually learn something about the ground state as you uh, run the calculation, which is nice. So in particular, the nodal surface of the wave function you don't need to input. You don't need to know anything about the nodal surface. The nodal surface, if you like, emerges in the course of the simulation. So uh, that's with the full CI quantum Monte Carlo. And this I, uh, which we call the initiator, introduces a kind of a Darwinian twist to this, um, to this algorithm, which greatly convert it improves the... Uh, rate of convergence. It does so at the cost of an approximation, but the approximation is itself systematically improvable. So that's essentially uh, uh, the, you know, the main content uh, of the method. Um, but once you've got your, these, many, these emergent many electron wave functions, you can then do things with them, like calculate density matrices, Yeah, later on, uh, later on, uh, we'll, we'll, yeah, I'm just talking, and then we'll see specific examples uh, later on. And then once you've got these things, you can calculate your reduced density matrices, uh, which are specific operators, and then from these operators, you can calculate other properties and so on. So in principle, you have a fairly complete uh, method um, uh, which can generate you more or less exact results for fairly sizable systems. Not as big as we would like, unfortunately, but we're working on it. OK, now the key, really key step, and it's a surprisingly difficult one to, to, uh, to accept, is to actually forget about the notion of these amplitudes, this CI vector, uh, which, uh, if you think about it, always ties you to this gigantic Hilbert space. And uh, that more or less kills you. Uh, before you've even started. So if you think about amplitudes, then you have to think about approximations to the amplitudes. In essence, that's what in, you do in many body theory. But instead, what we do is we think about walkers. Now, walkers is a term that's used in quantum Monte Carlo. Uh, it essentially means when you're talking about walkers, it means you're talking about delta functions. That, so when we talk about a walker, we mean delta functions. And in our, the context of our method, uh, 
Because our Hilbert space is finite, it's very large, it might have 10 to the 16 components to it, but it's still finite, our walkers are then Kronecker deltas. Okay, Kronecker deltas are a lot easier to think about than Dirac deltas. And Dirac deltas, which somehow sit in continuum spaces, is what you normally use in um, conventional quantum Monte Carlo. Now, uh, there are a, a number of advantages, I would say crucial advantages, to, uh, to working in finite Hilbert spaces, despite the fact that they're very large, and hence dealing with Kronecker deltas. So I'll talk about those a little bit later. Um, in some ways it is, but it, it's in a, yeah, let's, I'm going to come to that in a second. Uh, so, yes, in some ways it is. Um, the crucial point about walkers is that we're dealing with distributions. And so, and then those distributions describe our, uh, uh, our wave function. Okay, so in general, we're going to deal with uh, a large population of walkers. NW is the number of walkers, and this, uh, these populations will be on the order of millions or even billions of walkers, large populations. Um, and actually large enough for interesting statistical mechanics, in other words, to, uh, to arise uh, among our walkers. So these are not going to be, so our walkers will have a certain interaction between them, and that's the interesting thing. Um, so each walker will be associated with a slated determinant. So each walker will have, a, will have a slated determinant. And I should point out that you can think of slated determinants as binary strings. So here is, is, is the length of the binary string. It's equal to 2m. And um, a given slated determinant will just be a binary string. So 1 for an occupied orbital and 0 for an unoccupied orbital. So actually, from the point of view of a classical computer, there's an ideal uh, architecture for it, actually. Uh, so there's an ironic sense in which uh, fermions are, are ideal for classical computers. Don't tell your quantum computing friends that, by the way. They won't like it. OK. Now, the other thing is that apart from this binary string, which each walker will have, each walker will also have a sign associated with a plus one or minus one. So those are the two defining characteristics of our walkers, binary string and sign. And, um, and so henceforth, we're only going to be concerned with essentially a population dynamics of our walkers. Um, but whenever we want to come back to quantum mechanics uh, and our wave function, um, we're then going to say that the uh, CI amplitude on any given determinant will be proportional to the number of walkers instantaneously on that determinant. And of course, this will be a strongly fluctuating entity. Okay. So this is essentially you're summing over all your walkers, and if a particular walker is on that determinant, you uh, add in its sign. But the way the algorithm is going to be constructed is that at the end of every iteration, you'll only have, ever have walkers of one sign on any given determinant. And that's actually a crucial part of this uh, story. OK, so here is a pictorial example. So along this line is some description of our configuration space. So you can imagine that there are 10 to the 16 components along that line. Okay, So that is our description of our, of our uh, system. And I have now distributed 11 walkers on this space. 6 positive, 5 negative. Um, so uh, that's uh, NW is 11. And the first thing to point out is that you can, of course, have more than one walker on a given determinant. <laughs> In fact, the important determinants will actually accumulate walkers as time goes on. That's actually a good thing in, in our algorithm. Whereas the unimportant determinants will have no walkers on them, and you won't be wasting any, any CPU memory or effort in describing those. But they'll still be accessible. 
So there is no sense in which we're going to be truncating our space. The whole space is available for exploration. But at any instant in time, we will have basically a pretty coarse snapshot of, of, our, uh, of our system. Um, so here you see, so each walker is one of these, uh, one of these delta functions. That's basically it. Um, now the other thing to point out is that you can think of uh, a vector ni which is analogous to the ci vector. So this vector ni would have the same dimension as the original ci vector, but that's not something that we actually store. And you can see that the L1 norm of that uh, vector ni is the uh, number of walkers. So when we're dealing with uh, simulations, as will be later on, where we're dealing with a fixed number of walkers, essentially what you have to think about is we're doing calculations on vectors that have a fixed L1 norm. That is, which is kind of an unusual thing, because that's not what we do when we normally do quantum mechanics. What we normally do in quantum mechanics is work with vectors that have a fixed L2 norm, which is the fixed normalization. Instead, the normal normalization, which is given by the sum over the squares of the number of walkers and then square rooted, this object determines the magnitude of, our, uh, of each of our delta functions. Okay. So if you're dealing with a normalized distribution such that this object has been set to 1, then you've got a different, your L1 norm will then be some number. It won't be equal to 1, of course. Um, but um, that is the, uh, so you can either fix your L1 norm and then you end up with different L2 normalization, or you can fix your L2 norm and you end up with different L1 normalizations. But in essence, what our method is going to be doing is essentially fixing the L1 norm. Okay. Um, and so what we want to do is to interpret... Uh, the imaginary time, many, uh, the imaginary time uh, Schrodinger equation, which, you know, is um, uh, so, so the imaginary time Schrodinger equation is dH by, do I use tau there, or I use beta, which is some kind of imaginary time parameter, is H psi and then we have a minus sign here. So that's the imaginary time Schrodinger equation. If you were to propagate this for large beta, that would converge you onto the, uh, onto the ground state solution. So uh, psi of beta is e to the minus beta h acting on some initial, some initial uh, solution. And in the infinite time, or some initial trial vector, and as beta goes to infinity, this projects out the ground state, uh, the ground state uh, solution of the problem. So if you take this imaginary time Schrodinger equation and you substitute the full CI expansion, what you end up with is this expression here. So you have dCI by d beta. This would, if you like, be the instantaneous force on a given uh, CI coefficient, if you're con just dealing with a conventional CI calculation. And that instantaneous force would be nothing other than minus the Hamiltonian operator acting on, so this should be J rather than I, it would be the Hamiltonian acting on your CI vector. And that would be the, uh, the, um, uh, the imaginary time Schrodinger equation for our CI coefficient. So now what we're going to do is we're going to introduce a parameter that I call the shift uh, into, this, into this problem. And the shift acts only on the diagonal, so that modifies this operator, so it only acts on the diagonal. And obviously, if we're at a stationary point, so the dCi by d beta is 0, so we're at the stationary point there, then this object uh, is a corresponding eigenvector, and the corresponding shift would be the eigenvalue. 
And if you were to take the lowest energy one of those, that would give you the ground state eigenvalue. So this shift parameter that we're going to use as a population control parameter at convergence will directly give you the exact energy for the problem. So in our population dynamics. So that's quite an interesting uh, point of view, which, of course, in Monte Carlo is well known. And so we're going to reinterpret this uh, this uh, equation in terms of a population dynamics of a set of positive and negative walkers in such a way that in the infinite beta limit, the infinite time limit, the expectation value of our uh, um, number of walkers on any given determinant will become exactly proportional to the full CI solution of the problem. And so that means that if you have a CI coefficient that is, has a tiny, tiny value, so it's an unimportant one, it will only occasionally be visited by one of, your, by one of our walkers. And, you know, will, as in its time average, will actually acquire its exact value. That's the idea. Okay, so, uh, um, so this we can sort of uh, think of in a, in a differential way. Um, the first thing that we do is we actually define uh, a, a matrix K which is the original Hamiltonian matrix. And we, for convenience, it's kind of, it's nice to actually subtract out the Hartree-Fock energy from the uh, diagonal values. So that means that the, all the, uh, all the uh, diagonal uh, matrix elements of K are either zero if they're the Hartree-Fock determinant or they're positive. And... Um, well, I've, I've, I've more or less said what I've just said on this slide, that if you're dealing with uh, uh, a stationary distribution, so dCi by dt equals zero, that implies uh, you have a, uh, uh, an eigenstate of k. Of course, if you have an eigenstate of k, you also have an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. And the corresponding shift would then be the exact correlation energy, uh, E minus E zero, uh, this Hartree-Fock energy. And the important point is that any initial distribution, so if you start off with any, any initial distribution, random vector set of uh, coefficients, and you simply iterate, if you were to carry out this matrix vector product many, many, many times, that would actually lead you to the exact solution, ground state solution. So it's a totally robust, uh, totally robust algorithm if you could implement it. So the reason why you cannot implement this is, of course, if you're just dealing with your amplitudes, then uh, you have to store this entire vector. And actually, you need two copies of it, one the vector, one for the uh, force, and that pretty much kills you. So it's really the memory bottleneck, ultimately, that is the real killer in many body theory. Um, OK, so instead, what we want to do is to think of the processes implied here by this force update in terms of a population dynamics. And uh, so to do that, we're going to separate out uh, the diagonal term. So KII minus S times CI. And uh, we're going to interpret this step as a uh, diagonal death step. Okay? So... You imagine you have a set of walkers, maybe one, maybe more, on your uh, um, slater determinant, on, 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 on determinant i. You're then going to kill walkers, each walker, with the probability that's going to be proportional to kii minus the shift. So let's, for the moment, set the shift parameter to zero for the sake of argument. Then you will kill the walkers with a probability given by KII. So that is the first step in the population dynamics. Rather than applying KII to CI, we're going to discretize CI in terms of walkers, run through each walker, and then say, OK, the first walker, will you die with the probability KII or not? If you die, you remove it. If you don't die, you leave it. Then you go to the next one. You do the same thing. 
So we want to essentially develop this notion of population dynamics instead of vector or matrix acting on vector, in other words. That's the, this is the crucial point. Now, so the, so, the, so the diagonal death step, in a way, is the easiest one to, uh, to, to, to imagine. Now, what about this one? This is saying Kij times Cj. So what this would be doing would be sending uh, flux amplitude from determinant j onto determinant i at a rate given by Kij times Cj. So again, we're going to now think of that as a kind of birth step. So we sit on determinant j. So if we're a walker on determinant j, we now try to create a walker on determinant i with the probability given by Kij. That's the idea. So that's how we construct our population dynamics. But you will say, well, hang on. Kij can be positive or it can be negative. How are you going to handle that? Well. The answer is that if Kij is negative, then I will construct. I will construct. Uh, then, then I will give birth to a walker of the same sign as the parent, and if the Hamiltonian matrix is uh, positive, I will give birth to a walker of the opposite sign. And this inversion in sign comes because uh, we're dealing with the ground state problem. So. We have this minus sign uh, there. So these off-diagonal terms give rise to these spawning processes. And then after all birth, so these spawning processes, birth processes, and death processes have taken place, there's an all-important annihilation step uh, that I'll talk about in a second. So, so the, uh, uh, the overview of our algorithm is... Um, so I call it as a random game of life, death, and annihilation. We typically start off with one or maybe ten walkers, something like that, on our, it doesn't really matter, on our Hartree-Fock determinant. An initial value of the shift that we set to zero and a time step tau that's fixed. Again, our code is, um, uh, chooses the time step on the fly, so to speak, in the build-up phase of the simulation. So you don't have to worry about the time step either. And at each step, each walker gives, tries to give birth. Each walker then tries to die. And then after all birth and death processes have taken place, we have this all-important annihilation step. And what that annihilation step is a pairwise removal of walkers of the opposite sign that have ended up on the same determinant. So if you had, let's say, a positive walker here and a negative walker was spawned onto it, then at the end of that, uh, end of that iteration, assuming the positive walker itself hadn't died in the meantime, you, those two annihilate each other and you remove them from the simulation. And this is, if you like, this is the crucial fermionic step in this algorithm. And then finally, if you're working in constant uh, number of walker uh, uh, NW mode, that should have a W here, you then adjust the shift and go back and iterate. And the shift is adjusted according to some uh, ex uh, logarithmic uh, criterion. OK, so as a pictorial example, so here is, uh, here is a spawning event. So here is one walker attempting to spawn another walker here. Now, there's a choice to be made because this walker could have actually spawned anywhere. So we'll discuss uh, uh, how that, that choice is made. But, uh, it, but in essence, uh, the probability of spawning depends on the Hamiltonian matrix element connecting the two and the generation probability of this determinant from that one. The death event is when this walker then attempts to die. And then finally, the annihilation event is uh, two walkers of the opposite sign on the same determinant. At the end of the iteration, they annihilate each other. And you've ended up with another distribution. So uh, somebody asked about the nodal structure of the wave function. Well, essentially, the nodal structure is the sign structure of this vector. Some determinants have positive amplitude, some determinants have negative amplitude. And at the end of this 
iteration, you have a different distribution with potentially a different nodal structure. Um, and the whole aim of, of FCI QMC is to just generate many, many, many distributions in such a way that in the long time limit, you actually converge onto the exact solution. Okay, so that sounds a bit like magic. How can you do that? And in fact, the rules of this game are more or less unique, so you can't mess with them. So uh, uh, if you mess with them, you'll end up with the wrong solution, in other words. And so these are the rules. Um, so, and you can actually derive them from the underlying imaginary uh, Schrodinger equation. So let's first of all deal with the uh, spawning rule, so the probability to spawn. So let's suppose here you're a walker on this determinant, triple excitation, and that determinant is connected via the Hamiltonian to these ones, shown dotted line. Of course, the connectivity in practice is very large. It's more than four. Uh, but I've only indicated four for the sake of uh, just convenience. Now, the first thing that we do is we select another determinant, let's say this one, with some probability. And um, so P gen is the generation probability of determinant J, it's this one, from the original determinant I, uh, uh, this one. Now, in, in our method, this generation probability can essentially, uh, so the, can essentially be arbitrary, subject to two, uh, two, two constraints. The first is that if two determinants are connected via the Hamiltonian, then the generation probability has to be non-zero. So you cannot, uh, if you like, ignore uh, certain uh, uh, links uh, in your Hamiltonian. If the Hamiltonian matrix element connecting two determinants is non-zero, you must have a non-zero probability of generating that move. That's the first thing. Um, the second is that whatever is the algorithm you choose to make your move, you have to be able to calculate the probability of making a particular move. Okay, so whatever is the algorithm that does the move must also return the number, which is the probability that it actually made that move and not some other move. Okay, so uh, if you, of course, make the moves with uniform probability, in this case, that generation probability would just be a quarter, and that would be relatively easy to do. And actually, in our early work, we actually use uniform generation uh, for simplicity, but it's an inefficient way of doing it. So we've, uh, and I'll talk about imp improvements of that later on. But the crucial point is that these generation probabilities are normalized. So that if I sum over for any given determinant i, sum over all connected j's, the generation probability sum to exactly one. And so if you, whenever you as I'm sure, immediately after this lecture, you're all going to go and start, start programming this. That is one constraint that you have to ensure that your generator, your probability, your algorithm that generates you your excitation is normalized. So if you sum over all connections to any given determinant, you end up with one. Okay, so, so you make this move and you end up in your subroutine that, that makes this move or attempts to make this move generates you this number, which is the probability of making the move. Then you calculate the Hamiltonian matrix element between these two. So that's, again, easy to do. You take the absolute value of that, and you multiply it by a time step tau. And that then gives you your spawning probability. So that'll give you a number like 0.69. Okay. So then you generate a uniform random number between 0 and 1, and 69% of the time, you would accept that move. 31% of the time, in that case, you would reject it. If you reject it, it means that spawning operation is aborted, and you move on to the next walker. If you accept it, then you're going to actually create a walker on J. And, uh, and the sign of the walker that you're going to create then depends on the sign of the Hamiltonian matrix element connecting the two, and the, sign, and, and the sign of the parent. So if the Hamiltonian matrix element is negative, the child will have the same sign as the parent, and if it's positive, it'll have uh, the opposite sign. So that 
more or less defines the, uh, the spawning uh, process. Um, now, you'll note that the generation probabilities, if you're doing things uniformly, doesn't unfortunately scale very favorably. Because around each determinant, you've got roughly n squared, m squared uh, connectivity, so that your probability to, to selecting any one of them, if you're doing it uniformly, will go as 1 over n squared uh, over m squared. So those are probabilities that are coming crashing down. So if n squared, m squared is 10 to the 6, then 1 over it is 10 to the minus 6, and uh, that uh, is, is one thing. So the role of this time step, tau, is to somehow bound this spawning probability. So if your generation probability is, let's say, 10 to the minus 6, and these Hamiltonian matrix elements, let's say, are typically on the order of 10 to the minus 2, something like this, 10 to the minus 3, then this product will be on the order of, let's say, 10 to the 4, and you don't want to be spawning 10 to the 4 walkers. So that's where the time step comes in. And that time, time step tau has to be then sufficiently small so that the spawning probability remains kind of bounded. You don't want to be spawning more than one walker. You can spawn more than one walker. So if, for example, PS turned out to be 11.2, then what that would mean is you'd spawn 11 walkers with probability 1, and then 20% of the time you would spawn another walker as well. But generally speaking, we want to avoid having what we call walker blooms, where one walker creates a whole mass of other walkers there, because they then take take time to uh, to eff effectively uh, re-equilibrate. So we typically choose our tau so that the spawning probability rarely exceeds one. You can tolerate it occasionally exceeding one, but uh, you don't want it to, to uh, grow out of hand. There is actually a fundamental limit on the, on the time step that, are, that we'll come to uh, in a second. And that's to do with the probability of death. Okay, so the probability of death, uh, so this walker here now attempts to die, and it dies with a probability that's given by the energy of the determinant minus the Hartree-Fock energy. So we, by convention, subtract out the Hartree-Fock energy. So this will always be a number that's uh, either zero or bigger than zero. And um, if, we do, if we're in variable shift mode, you then subtract out the value of the shift. Uh, from it as well. But let's suppose we're, 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 we're in non debt we're in sort of fixed shift mode, and S is zero. So then the probability of death is basically given by the energy of the Hamiltonian. Um, so the higher, so if you happen to be born on a high energy determinant, then I'm sorry, you will die with a high probability. If, on the other hand, you happen to have been born on a low energy determinant, then you are likely to survive. Uh, for a number of uh, time steps. So what the death step does is to, if you like, concentrate the walkers uh, on the low energy determinants uh, of, your, uh, of your Hilbert space. Whereas the spawning process is more or less quite agnostic as to where you end up spawning. So you, you typically end up creating walkers on high energy determinants and they die relatively quickly. Uh, those that are spawned onto low energy determinants live long enough to be able to themselves have children and propagate the process. So that is, roughly speaking, the, uh, the, uh, this game. Um, and now you can see that when we're going to variable shift mode, the shift uh, which will equal the correlation energy, the correlation energy is always negative. So as you go into variable shift mode, you enhance the probability of death. In other words, that's, uh, that is, uh, in essence, what's going on. And that's how the system does its population control. So typically, you have an exponential process, birth processes that are giving rise to increasing numbers of walkers. Then you're getting uh, how you control the uh, the, this explosion is typically through the death step. And that reduces, uh, makes S negative, which enhances the, uh, the probability of death. And this balance between the two fixes more or less uh, what the uh, probability uh, of death is. Of course, there's the other process, which is the annihilation process, which also limits the, uh, limits the uh, particle growth as well. 
Okay. So that's the description in vanilla, plain vanilla form of the algorithm. Um, uh, and now, if we want to calculate the energy, which is like the most basic quantity we want to do, uh, we typically do it through what's called a projection formula. Now, you're probably used to, in quantum mechanics, dealing with expectation values of the type psi, operator psi. That's great, but they're very difficult operators uh, to, uh, to handle, very difficult expectation value to handle. So instead, we deal with this uh, projected thing where you see psi, the wave function that is being sampled, is, let's say, only in the ket, not in the bra. And in the bra, instead, is a trial wave function. In this case, the Hartree-Fock determinant, d0. And that d0 h psi divided by uh, d, uh, d0 psi. So that's the overlap between the exact wave function and your trial wave function on the, on the denominator. Now, obviously, if psi were the exact solution to the problem, so h psi just gave you the energy times psi, then uh, this would, in fact, give you the exact energy. Because in that case, the, the, the numerator and the denominator would exactly cancel, leaving you just the energy. Um, so that's why this is uh, a useful uh, object. If psi were exact, the corresponding energy would be exact, but it's much easier to handle. Um, now, you can actually work it out that uh, what you end up with is the Hartree-Fock energy. So that's when, when you sum over j, uh, uh, j is actually equal to the, that's the first term where j is equal to the um, Hartree-Fock determinant, d0, plus a set of corrections that uh, uh, runs over the double excitations of d0. In principle, also the single excitations. But in Hartree-Fock theory, uh, the singly excited determinants uh, have a zero Hamiltonian matrix element with the Hartree-Fock determinant, so their contribution drops out. But you could easily include the singles in here as well. So you have D0 H D J, so that's the Hamiltonian matrix element connecting the Hartree-Fock with the double excitations, times Cj over C0. And that gives you your, uh, uh, the, cor the contribution of the cor corresponding double. Now, this might, to, to the uninitiated, you might think, well, if that's true, then all you need is to do a calculation truncated at your doubles, and that would give you your exact energy. But that's actually not the case, because these CJs, the, co the amplitude at the double, is itself connected to the rest of the space, to the triples and the quadruples, and the triples and the quadruples are connected to the fifth and sixth order uh, slated determinants and so on. So you have, a, you, have a, you have a problem in which all the, all the determinants get involved in determining the amplitudes on every single determinant, but only the ones of the doubles enter this expression for the energy. So you have this ratio Cj over C0, and now we replace that ratio with the number of walkers uh, on, the, uh, on the respective determinants. So again, that's in the plain vanilla form of this uh, algorithm. Now you can see the problem immediately is that you've got this n0 here, which is the number of walkers on the Hartree-Fock determinant explicitly entering this expression. And what does that mean is that, well, that, first of all, that number better not be zero because you won't get anything out of this. And the other is that you want that number to be quite large so that the fluctuations in that number are not too severe. So the fluctuations in the denominator are, are, uh, are particularly damaging. So in other words, the, 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 the method works whenever you have been able to accumulate enough walkers on the uh, reference uh, determinant. And then uh, everything uh, will, will work fine. OK, so let's actually just s uh, see a simulation in practice. Uh, how much time, by the way, do we have? All right, OK, then, okay, then we'll have coffee now, and then we'll. Yeah, no problem.